I got to worship you. I got to be close to you. I got to be near you. I got to tell you how much I love you. I got to tell you how much you mean to me because you pressure. I was just sitting, I was talking to the worship team this morning. And God keeps telling me authority. 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 And what I think we have took a posture with God, where we just wait for whatever he just do when he do it. And his word says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. So I kept asking God, and we're going to talk about it a little bit today. What are the keys? Like what? I, I want to go deeper in this because I've been, I've been preaching this. I've been taught this all my life. What are the keys to the kingdom of heaven? What are the keys? When the next verse, he explains it. He says, whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, I'll lose in heaven. I'm like, I get that, Lord, but can we go deeper? Is there more I can get out of that? He says, and that's why I had to look up the word. And it says, you have the authority. So if I give my son the authority to get in the car and go drive and do whatever he want to do, hang out with his friends and come back at a certain time, he can do what he want to do. I've granted him the authority. So for him to sit there in front of me and be like, well, Dad, I was going to leave, but I was waiting for you to just Tell me to go start the car for me and, and put the gas in it. But you had the authority. And God has said, I've given you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Why are y'all not driving the car? Why are y'all waiting for me to do it? You, you got to bond. You got to lose. You got to move it. You have the authority. And he reminded me, it's the same thing in Genesis. He created the man, Adam, and he placed him in the garden. He says, you have dominion. I'm only going to back up through you, Adam. I'm only going to operate through you, Adam. Y'all sit down now. I'm about to go in. I, I'm only going to operate through you. I'm, I'm giving you dominion. I'm going to create the, uh, Eden, the world, and I'm going to make a garden in the east there. Where that's the place where me and you are at. That's the place where me and you hang out and dwell. And that's the place where you come and we hang out. He says, he says but I need you to understand something. You have dominion. I didn't, he didn't name it the lion and the bear. He said, Adam, you name him. You got dominion. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to operate through you. I'm going to bring my woman. I'm going to create the woman. I'm going to bring her to you. You name her. Woman, womb, man, because she was taken from you. I'm giving you dominion. He says the same thing I've been saying since Genesis. All I did was took my promise off the people, and I put it on the, over the church. Now y'all have authority. And he keeps reminding me, I, don't not, I do not have you in a season where I won't punk Christians. Sissy Christians have authority. Tell heaven what it needs to be doing. Tell heaven how it needs to move according to the word of God. But he will not do it until we declare it, decree it with authority. Yes. My, my, my daughter, uh, we promised her that we were going to hang with her and spend some time with her. And um, we were sitting there talking about scripture and loving on each other and, and looking at each other's eyes and little hearts and playing around. And she was over there playing at Kanga, this place of independence. So she runs up. And she stops and looks at us with her blue lips because she had this blue sushi. And she says, get up right now and come play with me. Because y'all said y'all will play with me. And she walked off and she went back to playing. And you know what we did? We got up out our seat and we said, she's right. And we move. According to what she, she didn't say get up and then turn around and say, are they going to come? Are we going to get in trouble? That's not what she did. She said, y'all gave me your word that this was going to happen for me, so y'all need to get up and back your word. And because we're honest, we said we got to back our word. And if we be sinful people, how much more will our Father in heaven? He said, my word will not return to me void. So if I'm telling you I need you to operate in faith and declare and speak it, I need you to say it with your chest, turn around and walk off and live your life like my word is true. Like what I said, you knew and understood and believed exactly what I said. We've been in a series called Serve. We've been in a series called Serve. And this is week three. I had to hurry up and throw this series out here for us because we're going into our word of the year and our vision for the year next month, and I had to get us ready. We've been in a season called Serve. This is week three. We got one more week. I may still another week and make a week five, but Ashley Rose is supposed to preach, and I'm, she's going to probably be mad because I already jacked her for a date before. I really want to jack her again for her. I want to throw this other one in there. Me and her negotiate that later and see if she let me get to the buffer. Uh, I promise you I'll double you up later. Now, we may have a week five, but today is week three. And, and the topic today... A week three is kingdom mindset. And I, I wrestled with this kingdom thing for years. I've been talking about it for years. I've been preaching it. And for years, I want to continue to take us deeper in it. The kingdom mindset. We have grown in the United States of America 
we call it westernized Christianity, but what I like to call it, we have a restaurant mentality. We have a consumeristic mentality. We have been programmed in the church to come in the church like it's a restaurant. We come in, we look at what everybody's doing, we sit there, we ain't doing nothing. We act like we don't have God in us. Because a lot of us who come in to visit, we're Christians, we'll sit there and see who do, who do stuff to me and how they react to me. And if I feel comfortable and if I don't like it, I'm going to just go to another restaurant. We have been programmed with this restaurant mentality. We have been programmed in life because everything out here is competing for our attention. This cell phone company is competing against this phone, cell phone company. This loan and bank wants you to come, and this person wants you to follow them, and this person wants you to subscribe, and this is in competition for you, and these house people is in competition for you, and Ford say you come buy our car, and Buick say their car is better. So our whole life we're programmed to, to, for competition. Who's going to compete for our attention? Who's going to give us the best deal? I, 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 I ain't going to lie. I call, uh, we got Spectrum. And about three months ago, I was sitting on the couch. I said, it's been a few years. So I called Spectrum. I said, now here it go. I can go to Google. I like my deal is cool, the little 110 I pay for, uh, for internet and cable is cool, but Google just sent me something in the mail. Yeah. And either y'all gonna load this, lower this bill or I need some extra channels or some, some fast or something because oh, I can just go to Google and save me about 20 bucks a month. And the lady was like, I'm so glad you called. I'm so glad you're with me. We love, thank you for being a faithful car for about six, seven years. We, we will love, I, I thank you you called us first. Let me see what I can do. I got me an extra 100 megabytes of internet speed. Got me a little discount. And so I'm like, I said, I said, she, she gave me the extra speed. I said, that's cool, but that still don't make sense for the extra 20. I, I mean, they can give me that, that speed. She said, hold on, give me a second. Let me hold for a while. She said, I can't do too much, but this is what I can do. This is what I can do. She said, I can lower it for the next six months. I can give you this little $10 off. I'm like, I take it. <laughs> I, wanted to get, I wanted as much as I can get out of them with giving as little as I can give. And we have took that same mentality in the church. I want to take as much as I can drain and suck out of the experience with giving as little as possible. We're investing as little as possible. And that's, is, that's not the kingdom of God. Let me give you some scripture. Let me give you some scripture. Because I like scripture. Actually, I want to give us our serious scriptures first. Before I, cause I got, let me, because I want to, we only got one more, two, maybe two more weeks, depending on my argument with Ashley Rose. I, I, let me give you these scriptures. I want to drill this, drill this into us. John chapter 13, verse 14. And since I, your Lord, when they get ready to get, when they get ready to get, when Jesus is talking, we better really be knowing that, that, word, that word is bond. He says, and since I, your Lord, your God, and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. Now, we did this. I, I exemplified this in front of y'all. What, week, what was that, week one? Where I got up on the stage and I washed feet. And you realize how, how, how humbling it was to get down there and take out a grown man's foot and put it in your face and wash it. But, God, but Jesus literally said, I set an example for you. I'm about to go to the cross. We're about to commune. I'm about to go be betrayed. He said, but I'm going to set a clear example to y'all how I want you to serve. How I want you to, I'm sorry, how I want you to love. Because you love through serving. Serving is a byproduct of love. You cannot love if it's no serving. For God so loved that he, it was an automatic serve because he gave. Love goes down so other people can what? Go up. That's our definition for love. Compassionately, righteously, and selflessly pursuing the well-being of somebody else. He says here, he says, I've given you an example, verse 15, to follow. Do as I've done. I tell you the truth, slaves are no greater than their masters, nor the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. He said, if I can do it, you can do it. Our second scripture for the series. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. We got the old commandments. We got that 10. He said, but we learned in week one, all those 10s can be wrapped in this one, the text said, Paul said. He said, love each other just as I've loved you. Y'all need to treat each other just as I have treated you. Christian, Christ-like. So if you really act in Christ-like, you're loving each other because why? That's what I've done to you. He says, he says, love each other just as I've loved you. You should love each other. For your love, watch this, for your love, for, for love, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I love this because we always take the person who speaks the most tongues or sing the best and get the whole church crying and them got the most gifts and we put them on the plateau. When actually the Bible says at his own mouth, Jesus says, how they will know you are my disciples, it will be a clear cut, clear evidence is how you love each other. 
Walk in the church and see who the person loving the most. That's your richest person in the church. Who the one that always, everybody talking about her and laughing at her, but she don't care. She's just smiling, walking around, serving people, picking up trash, doing whatever she can to build the house of God. When somebody's stepping her foot, it's okay. She's just always so passive and happy. Sometimes it's funny how people being happy irritate other people. And that, that's why you see a difference of spirits. The person that's always happy, always serving, always forgiving, always want to help, that's your greatest, richest person. That ain't my word. That's the Bible. Not the one who speaks the most tongues. Everybody, when they go up there, everybody scream, and the audience and the, the big audience scream for that particular person because that's their favorite. No, no, no. He says how they would know you are my disciples, that you follow me, not just believe in me, but you follow my ways, that you actually uh, example, and I example, is how you love each other. Last verse of the series. I don't know how I've been missing this in the last few weeks. Watch this. He says Galatians 5. Amplify. I love to amplify. It's like a Bible commentary inside of the scripture. Verse 13. For you, my brothers, were called to freedom. He said, I released you from the sin payment, the debt payment. He said, only don't let your freedom become an opportunity for the sinful world, uh, for your sinful nature. Worldliness, selfishness, selfishness. He says, you are free from the law. You're free now, but do not use your freedom to indulge your flesh. To do whatever you want to do, just be out here sinning and acting a fool. He said, that's not what you use your freedoms for. He said, let me tell you what you use it for. He said, don't use it for selfishness. He says, but through what? Love? Where are we at? Through love? Serve. I didn't make this stuff up. I just got it out the Bible and I'll be reading it. Y'all be thinking I, be, I do be making this some stuff. But it's right there in the Bible. Through love, serve, and seek the best for one another. He says, since I freed you from the, from, the, some, from the payment of sin, and I've took care of that. Paul told Corinth, he said, look, look, look. I mean, to Galatia, he said, look, 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 look. Now use that freedom that you have. Now, now you ain't got to do all the 613 laws. Now that free you, don't kick it with that freedom. You, now take all that energy and put it into serving and loving each other. He says, watch this. He says, and seek the best one in verse 14. For, for the law, for the whole law concerning human relations is fulfilled in this one precept. He said, all that law is actually fulfilled in this one new commandment I'm giving you, as Jesus said. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, you shall have an unselfish concern for others and do things for their benefit. We cannot say that we are kingdom. We cannot say that we are Christians. We cannot say that we are walking this thing out if no part of that is our love for other people. And one reason how we know we can, how do we love other people we won't get connected to? How do we love other people we won't even come to church and be around? See, some of us think we got our personal relationship with Christ, and I love how people walk with Christ, and they got this deep thing. But part of how you prove that is connecting yourself to a body and serving the bride of Christ. We talked about it last week when I had uh, uh, non-denomination, non-denomination, I'm sorry, I didn't mess her name up. I had the mannequin up here, and I tried to depict to us how the entire body as a whole is one. We're going to talk about it more today. He's trying to get us to understand something. You need to be connected to the body. You need to be connected to the bride. I told y'all last week, God took his promises on the chosen people. He told Abraham, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he, he put a promise. He put a, a, a promise. That's why they say all your Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their fathers carried the promise down to the Israelites. And he said, I took that promise off because they rejected Christ when he came. And now he said, I'm going to put it on the church. The promise that I had on my people, now I'm giving to Jew and Gentile. And in the church, everybody accepted it. Everybody can come to me here. He said, but it only happens one way, if you love and serve each other. That's going to fulfill and really prove that y'all really love me. It's going to fulfill and really make, uh, 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 give evidence that y'all really rock with me. Watch this. He says, give me Acts chapter 1. We've been programmed, y'all, with a consumeristic mindset to come in, eat, and leave, and leave and rush out as fast as we can. We've been programmed that way. Give me Acts chapter 1, verse 1. Now watch this. This is the first book of Acts, chapter 1. My first book, I told you, Theophilus. Now, we believe Luke wrote this because he's talking, he introduces Theophilus. He's had a similar introduction in the book of Luke. So Luke is writing this. He says, about, he said, in, our first, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus uh, began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up to heaven and giving, his, uh, give, uh, and giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. He said, now I told you about this in my first book, but I'm explaining to y'all what Jesus did. He was taken up by the Holy Spirit, but this is what his last, this is what he was doing. Until the last day he was taken up, this is what he was on. He says in verse 3, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, after the resurrection, he appeared over, over the course of 40 days. 
Watch, he said he appeared to the apostles from time to time. Watch this. And he proved to them in many ways that he, actually was, he was actually alive, and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. So this is Jesus' last 40 days before his ascension, and he's talking to his disciples, appearing to them time to time, eat with them, chilling with them, about the kingdom of God. Now let's look at this, verse 4. Once he was eating with them, he talked about what, what happened once. Once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends the gift he promised, as he told you before. John baptized with water, but now in a few days you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Watch this. He's giving them the kingdom agenda. Don't y'all leave out of here without waiting for the promised gift I gave you, which is the Holy Spirit. He says, don't move, don't start this church, don't start witnesses until I send you the gift that I promise you, which let me think about it. We cannot do kingdom work. We cannot be kingdom without the Holy Spirit. It is impossible for us to call ourselves kingdom and walking in God's purposes, pulling heaven down to earth, vessels for Christ to pour into, and through his Holy Spirit perform if we, don't have, if we ain't got no connection. If we don't have the Holy Spirit, he even told his disciples, don't move and touch a church until you get the Holy Spirit. He said, we, we, we need the Holy Spirit to carry out this agenda. He says, watch this, in verse 6, he says, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And it dawned on me, that's exactly how we are. God is trying to give us the kingdom of God, supernatural things, and put us on game. I'm about to send you a helper, the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you this new thing called the kingdom of God, my kingdom, my purposes. You're going to draw down me from heaven to earth. And all you're talking about is your kingdom. I'm trying to upgrade your anointing. So I put you in a valley, took your job away, crushed your car so you can sit at home for me for six months, and you complaining about your kingdom when I'm trying to give you my kingdom. When I'm trying to give you my purposes, when I'm trying to groom you and mature you to what I got for your life, but you complaining, you still talking about your kingdom? Why is Jesus standing in front of you eating with you talking about, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you, and I'm giving you all this heavenly information, and all you can think about is you. We know that back then that was in Roman oppression. We know back then things that happened to them, but they were so caught up in that, they said, when are you going to restore our kingdom? Watch what he says. He said, verse 6, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking the Lord, has the time come for you to free, uh, free Israel and restore our kingdom? We don't even ask God what he wants for our life. Just can you bless me, bless me, and do what I want for you? He said, he replied, verse 7, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. <laughs> In other words, if not KOT, Calvin Living Translation, In other words, man, shut up, and y'all listen to what I'm trying to tell y'all. Why, how are y'all worrying about yourself? That's for God to know. God going to set them dates and times. But watch what he says next. He says, he says, he says, it's not for you to know, but you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Let me get y'all back to the kingdom agenda. Y'all talking about your kingdom and what I can do for you. Okay, God got to set that up. God going to determine that. Okay, back to what matters. I, 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 I'm going to bear the Holy Spirit. He said, would y'all shut up for a minute and pay attention to what I'm trying to give you? He says, he says, he says, the Father alone has authority to set those dates and times. They're not for you to know, but you will receive the power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But, that's a conjunction. He, said, I'm a, he says, but, let me get y'all realigned with what I'm trying to give y'all. He said, I'm trying to give y'all something bigger than you. I'm trying to give y'all something greater than you. And all you can think about is your problems. It's like when you go into prayer, and you go into prayer thinking you're about to worship God and tell him how good he is, but you realize the whole prayer, all you did was ask him for your husband, your house, your wife, your car, your debt, your bills to be paid, and then you realize you didn't even really worship him at all. All you talking about was your kingdom. You never ask him, Lord, what do you want from me? Do you want me to suffer in this season? Cool, I'll suffer. If that's what you want, we didn't even ask him that. All we did was just, can you give me, give me, please, give me, give me, give me for my kingdom to be built, for my church to be bigger, for my house to be better, for my car to be upgraded. We didn't even ask him, did he, what did he want? He, watch this. He says, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when it comes upon you, and you will be my witness, my kingdom vessels. Watch this. Telling people about me everywhere, everywhere. He said, I need to realign you. I'm, I'm talking kingdom. Stay with me here. He's like, stay with me. Like, y'all, y'all worrying about other stuff. Come back to me. He says, you're going to be my witness. He says, he says, I'm giving you authority. He says, telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, where y'all comfortable, that's home. In Judea, that's still home, but it's a little outside. He says, in, in, in Samaria, y'all don't like them. So we always take the gospel and be witnesses and vessels and authority, even in places that we ain't like. Yep. He says, and to the ends of the earth, to places y'all don't even know yet, just be my kingdom vessels. He's trying to give them the kingdom purpose. He says, Jesus' priority was kingdom. See, the opposite of kingdom is worldly. They was only thinking about what their world was doing. God was like, I'm trying to give you kingdom. I'm trying to give you heavenly perspective. 
We got a, we got a, after we do our vision series, our series we're going to ride out for most of the year after that is our, a, a series I'm naming Clash of the Kingdoms, Culture versus Christ. Oh, we're going to hit everything. So if y'all don't want to be re, 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 rebuked, uh, convicted, and jacked up every Sunday y'all leave, y'all probably want to skip like that over six months. Because we're going to talk about everything. What does culture say you're supposed to do with your body? How does culture say you're supposed to wait for your husband? What does the word of God say? How does culture say you're supposed to spend your money? What does the word of God say? How does culture say you're supposed to forgive? How does, what does culture, I mean, what does God say? We're going to compare. See, we're going to, gotta, we, you got to have discernment. We're going to talk about that in our vision series. We got to raise our discernment to understand what's God and what's not God. And we have that really bad in the church. We think everything is God. And we have a black issue in the church, so we're a little too black. Like when God said, I need you to think kingdom. I need you to think kingdom of God. I, I understand what we need to do. We need to take a stance for injustice. And we got to have a stance for some of these things. But when we pull that stuff into the house of God and it starts to water down the word of God, it starts to water down our ability to serve and love each other, it's a problem. See, if y'all pay attention every week, these things kind of been similar. And every week he's saying, go serve. That's the king of kings. And this is us. And this week he's telling you, put on your kingdom mindset. I need you to put on a thought pattern that matches with my thought pattern. I need you to put on a, 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 a mindset that matches my mindset, my mindset. But we haven't did that. We've sit here and allowed the culture to take our mindset, twist it, and we drug that into the church. And then we modeled our churches after what culture has told us to be. We, our, our, we won't say certain things, but we will say certain things because we don't want to make nobody mad and make them leave. And I'm sorry if it's in the word of God, I'm going to do my best to study it, break it down, and I'm going to give it to you with as much love and, 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 and enthusiasm as I can give it to you. Yeah. So we can take, I'm, I'm going to hide in my heart, right? It says, I'm, I, I, your, your word that I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against it. He said, what it is, I've dug and put so much of you inside of me that when I see someone, I'm like, that ain't God, can't do it. Oh, that ain't God, can't do it. No, go, can't do it. He said, because I have you in me. I've took your word and I've stuffed it inside of me. And that's what we need to do to take down the kingdom mindset. reason why we're getting our behinds kicked by the enemy because we don't know his word. Listen, the Bible says the word is a sword. And what's the use if you got a sword and somebody run up on you and you can't use it? They're just going to smack you and take anything they want from you. And that's what's happening. The enemy is literally kicking our behinds because we don't know how to use the word of God. We don't know what rights and authority we have with the word of God. So we're sitting here living a defeated life when all we have to say is in the name of Jesus and stand on it and know that God's word is true and go and walk off. We out here stressing and worrying about our kids when all you got to do is say, in the name of Jesus, walk up to them on the door while they sleep. Walk up on the phone while you're talking to them and touch the phone while their voice is on the phone and bless them through the phone they won't even know. And speak life and speak victory over them and go to sleep. When we up on there like, Lord, oh my God, Lord, and let, me, let me call them. And like, no. Yeah. I had to put that in there because that was for me. See, sometimes at the end, you make me worry about my oldest son. He way off in Yale and doing his education thing and all these professors and scientists and people around him that he admires. And I sometimes think he's drifting. So I want to panic. I want to panic. Lord, he, he got to know the truth. No, no, I trust you. That's your kid. That's your kid. Oh, and I remember when I was 20, I was a fool. So here, let me just pray. Let me just pray and trust God that with, that you, that's your kid. And I had to give him back to God and stop trying to worry and stop trying to be pan and panicking that God wasn't going to, that he going to be, that he, something going to happen to him while he's out there. Or somebody going to take advantage of him and play him and take his money or rob him in the streets or something crazy. We'll let the enemy put all kind of craziness in our mind. Instead of standing on the word of God saying that's not in the name of Jesus. Set me up. Can y'all set me up? Set me up. I need to show y'all something. I need to show y'all something. We've, we've drugged this mentality into the church. We've allowed the world to t tell us how to do it. I went to a conference, bro, and all they talked about most of the time was how many people you got and how much money you bring in. And it drove me crazy. I call it nickels and noses. Everybody I met, like, hey, I'm Pastor Sunshine. So how many members you got? That's the first thing they would ask me. And I'm like, why, why is that so important? Like, why, why are we... Is it the measure of how we, are we going to be friends or not based on how big our church is? Like, we have drug this mentality in the church. And I call it, it's a, like we, we say, it's, I call it the restaurant mentality, this consumeristic mentality. And we program the people to do that. Uh, come on, y'all. Can you get, get the mics on? So I want to uh, get, come here. People, I'll ask you to for help me out today. I'm going to give me, give Essence y'all over here. Holly Nelson's y'all over here. The rest is y'all over here. I want to show y'all something. We're going to depict today a restaurant. 
I want to show y'all something. As I got ready for this lesson today, and I was, my heart was grieved because I, I understand when God called us to build this ministry and we planted it three years ago, when nothing meant more to me than the, than the Bible. Nothing, I wanted to do nothing more but share the love of Jesus with the world. I didn't really care about anything. I left my career. I left all my six figures. I left all my money. I sold all my Corvettes. And I just said, God, whatever you want from me, I'll do it. I'm going to really give you my life and see what happens for the man who just said, whatever you want, like, I'll do it. And I, sometimes I'm like, why did you say that? Because right after that, he showed me a church. I'm like, oh, Lord, I don't want to play no, oh, no, <laughs> anything but that, please. And I start to, like, come into this, and I start to study the Bible. Like, okay, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to obey you. you got to show me what you want this to look like. I'm not going to look at another church and pattern that. Uh, show me in your word what you want this to look like. So I start to study Acts, and I start to study the Gospels, and I start to study all this all the time. And I want to show you all something. Nisha, can you, can you be my waitress? You, y'all go ahead. Y'all just go ahead. Who, Tony and Tasha, where y'all, where y'all at? I'm listening to the whole, where my other table? Where my Lewis family table? Where Tony? Oh, they on their way. Y'all come on up. Here she come. I need y'all. So, so, so what I'm understanding is we have this consumeristic mentality to come into church, pop down. I mean, let me, y'all, my, half of my team is gone today. So I need to, I've been playing Mike, uh, I've been playing audio man too. So we come, we come into church and we pop down and we expect somebody to come serve us. And we sit to the side where nobody can see us or hug us and we pop down. And we say, we sit there, we look around and we, in our hearts, we just judge it. Who's saying something, who's looking at me funny, who ain't said nothing to me, who, who the pastor ain't spoke to me yet. I'm on this, I'm on that. I'm on this, I'm on that. Leave it alone, leave it alone, leave it alone. I'm on this, I'm on that. Like we will do that. And we'll sit there. And we'll let, we'll, we'll have one person racking their brain trying to serve everybody. We'll have one person racking their brain trying to do everything for everybody. While we complaining, we'll rack this one person brain. I read some statistics. The statistics say 6% of people in the church tie. I read another statistic. 24% actually serve the church. So you mean to tell me 76% is sitting around doing nothing and 94% on the other side ain't even helping, but they come and sucking up lights, gas, and water. They come and expect the pastor to marry them. They expect somebody to counsel them. They expect somebody to greet them. They, they come to every event that the church do, but they really don't even support the church. They'll sit at the table complaining, calling the person's name, then we get to gossiping on social media and and some, our subliminal posts because we're unhappy. And we'll sit there and complain because we have this consumeristic thing. And you know when we go to restaurants, you know, we, uh, she, ain't, she ain't brought my water yet. It's warm. That got her tip. It was 20. Now she at 10. If she just keep on, it's going to go down to 5. It, that's, then we'll sit there and look at her serve somebody else. We was here first. Like how, just because you ordered a 20-ounce steak, they just got some chips and salsa. We'll complain, and we can complain, and then we'll get mad. Y'all know what we do next when we get mad. We just going to leave. Like, we out of here because we don't like it. We got seven churches on the block. We can pick where we want to be. We can pick who going who to come to my Easter program, come to our church. We, we want you here, and we can miss it up. I got people in competition for my membership. I can go somewhere else. And we sit there and complain. Now, as I'm talking to y'all, it's even harder for y'all to pay attention because the booth is messing with stuff. They run in their mouth, and it's all these distractions everywhere. Well, so when the word of God is going forth and the souls are trying to be saved and things are trying to be done, the pastor and the leadership can't even do it because everybody around them that should be serving, that should be loving, is too busy being selfish. It's too busy worrying about themselves. It's too busy talking about everybody else instead of serving the purposes of God. See, all that music and all that noise, yeah, that's what it looks, that's what it sounds like. When you got the majority of the church sitting there not serving. Majority of the church not loving anybody, but they expect to be loved. They expect to be made comfortable. They expect to get all these things, but they don't want to participate. They don't want to be a part of anything that got anything to do with anybody unless it, unless it involves themselves. And you got one person running around trying to feed everybody. One person trying to run around and give everybody water. One person trying to pray for everybody. One person trying to intercede for everybody. One person on the worship team, on the welcome team, on the music team, on every team trying to do everything. Where everybody else sitting around like, well, 
And then we'll say, if you need me, let me know, Pastor. No, you just get involved. Don't wait for me to actually do something. Find something to do in the house of God. Find something to build the body of Christ. Some of y'all, just, y'all may just be social media warriors. I'm going to just sit here and support my church on social media. I can't do nothing yet. I don't see any needs. But I'm going to sit here and just support the pastor. And I'm going to just support on social media. And I'm going to just be on the social media team. Whatever it takes. But all they're doing is making a bunch of noise. And you got one person trying their best. One person doing all they can to show the love of Christ. And then they get tore up. And then they want to quit. Then all of a sudden, they don't even want to go to church anymore no because they're so beat up, they're so bruised, and they've taken on so much weight from trying to serve the entire church. They try to serve what the pastor asked them to do. They try to serve what the other minister asked them to do. They try to come early, and then they get mad and get burnt out. Now they, now they don't want to go to church no more. Now their faith is failing. And the more I talk, God can't do what he needs to do. God can't pray. I mean, God can't speak to the church. The church can't hear him. God can't go and give him kingdom purpose. He can't realign their vision because all they're doing is making a bunch of noise because they not happy. Instead of listening to God. And now they're complaining because what they got is not what they wanted. Now they're complaining about because the word wasn't good. Or they're complaining about, well, pastor didn't preach today. Uh, my favorite preacher didn't preach. So I'm going to just come with my favorite preacher preach because I don't like what Sister Essence preached. I don't like when they preach. And this is more and more what the church begins to sound like. A bunch of noise, and then you got drama that start happening. And people want to leave and walk out of there and get mad because something happened. Because there was no love. Because there was no servant. And everybody mad. They walked out the church. And then you know when some people, when they leave the church, they got to tear up some stuff on the way out. They got to make sure they drag some people with them. They got to make sure they destroy, destroy the reputation of the leaders. They got to make sure they do something because they didn't get served the way they wanted to be served. They had their restaurant mentality. Thank y'all. They, they took their role seriously. Y'all some good. Y'all are great. Get that, get it. That's what's happening in the church. Thank y'all, Booth. Y'all messed up stuff in the perfect way. I'm like, how are they going to do this? That was perfect. Thank y'all. And all while the pastor is going home crying. Because he's like, Lord, can I just have some faithful people? Can you just give me some fat people? Faithful, available, and teachable. But no, we'll text the pastor Monday, Tuesday morning and expect him to answer because I'm close to you. And all 20 people do that because all 20 think they're close. So on his off day, he can't even get any rest. Because now he feel like if I don't respond, if I don't serve, they're going to just complain and leave. So now you're trying to just honor God. And you're trying to do what he say, all while appeasing people. And then you don't even understand how you turn into a people pleaser. Because you're worried about the church and the status. People won't love. People won't serve. People won't support. People won't give. And when they get, when they get annoyed a little bit, they just leave. And you're like, what did I do, Lord? I'm telling y'all a season I went through. When people kept leaving, I'm like, I ain't, I've done all I possibly can to give you the word of God, to support you. To, what do you want? And I start to fall in depression thinking I did something wrong. Wondering like, Lord, is this what you want from me? And you know when, when God puts you in a situation, the first thing you do if you're a person who really try to live holy, where's the sin in my life? You start looking up, where's I, I something somewhere, God's punishing me. Lord, I ain't, I'm, I ain't, I don't see, I, I, I ain't perfect, but ain't no, I, I ain't, what's going on? All because people won't love and won't serve. And then the chatter and the disruption gets bigger than the church. And then what, and then I, 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 I fell into this. And God matured me quickly when I almost start to change and shift because I didn't want to upset people. Because I was worried about the church. How can we financially survive? How can we do this? And on the way out, some people try to rip my personality, rip my, my, my reputation. I'm like, I ain't never did nothing to you. If you don't want to be faithful, fine. Just, you know, hey, see you later. Find somewhere else that you enjoy. But I ain't did nothing. <laughs> my wife, we ain't did nothing. But that's what we do. We flip tables. Yes, All because the waitress didn't serve us fast enough. When what we should have done when we got out the car and pulled up and said, God, how do you want to use me today? I'm in your house now. I'm in your house now. What do you need from me? And it's funny because I don't know about y'all, but when somebody invites me over for a party, the first thing I ask them is what? What can I bring? Is there anything you need me to bring? Now, y'all do that for your homie house and party. But we'll come to church. And we don't ask, what should I bring? Y'all act like y'all don't believe in Jesus, too. Like y'all don't hear from him, too. 
So y'all can't come in here like, Lord, whoever I'm laying hands, it's my first time here, but if you need me to lay hands, oh yeah, this is a free environment in here. If you know Jesus, I, 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 go hook up with your brothers and sisters and build each other up. And we'll do that. And then God's purposes never get happen, never happen. I wanted to give y'all a depiction of what he was saying in Acts, and they was only worried about their kingdom. And they went, see, what could have happened is this table could have got up and came over here and helped her with this table. And said, here, we're going to help her out. Give us a second. What do y'all order? Fine. And run in there and help her out. And then you got three people serving. See, I, I want it to be one to eight because that's the ratio of the statistic that I read. And this is what it looks like. Now, tell me how is that telling me how is that the depiction of the kingdom of God? How is that a depiction of Christians in Christ? How can we prove to the world that he's real? How can we prove to the world that you should come be a part of something bigger and greater if this is how we act? And this is why people who don't believe in God don't come. Because this is all they see on social media. Complaining and griping. Or the same cleavage as everybody else. Or the same short skirt as everybody else. Or the same profanity of everybody else. And then everybody like, why would I come to church and be a part of it and see what God is about if that's what he looks like? Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19. Watch what Jesus is saying to Matthew. Now I say to you, Peter, which means rock, Petra, rock. He says, upon this rock I will build my church. Watch this, watch this. And all the powers of hell would not conquer it. He says, now I'm about to start my church. Upon you, Peter, I'm a, you're going to be the first pastor, leader. Upon this rock I'm going to build my church. He says, watch this, he says, watch this. He says, and the powers of hell will not be able to conquer it. He said, the devil won't be able to do, he won't be able to do nothing with you. He said, I'm going to give you a certain level of authority that the devil won't even be able to touch you. Yeah. Watch this. I'm not making this stuff up. Verse 19 said, and I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And as I was saying, I said, what is the keys of the kingdom? I kept asking God. He said, authority. He said, authority. Watch what the scripture says. He says, whatever you forbid... On earth will be forbidden in heaven. Whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Watch this. He's saying, I will back you from my throne. I'm going to go back to be with my father, and I'm going to march to the, your drum beat. If you tell me to go, that's what I'm going to do. If you say, God, just give me water, that's all you'll get. He said, now you could have got water, ice, turkey, steak, but you want water, that's all you're going to get. He said, I'm going to move according to how you want me to move. He said, you have the authority now. I'm giving you the power now to operate on the behalf of heaven. Church, I need church to represent. Y'all are my earthly representatives for heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He said, I need, I'm going to be with the Father. I'm done now. I'm going to give you the third part of the Godhead, the Trinitarian Godhead. I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit. Don't move without him. Take him and go out in the world and wreck it with me. And the devil won't be able to touch you. He says, he won't, the gates of hell will not prevail. He says, ain't nothing it'll be able to do. Not only, when the gate, not only will he not be able to touch you, he says, he can't keep you out. He said, you can walk up to that person struggling with that, that demon and say, in the name of Jesus, and put the oil on her, and the demon got to go. He said, ain't nothing the devil will be able to do with you. All you got to do is speak it in faith, and I'll move and back you according to your word. It's, it's, that writing is red. That's Jesus talking out of his own mouth. And I kept saying, why are we acting like we dead? Why are we moving like we ain't got no power? He said, y'all, I'm, I'm waiting for you. He said, even if you destroy it, I'll let you destroy it. I've given you the keys. Listen, listen, who in here rent? Rent an apartment, rent a house or something. Y'all got renters? What happens when you sign the agreement, the lease agreement? They give you what? Keys. keys. They don't come into your apartment six months in and say, it's dirty. Get out. They give you the, you have, they can't even come in without giving you a notice that, hey, we come in to do water, gas, makeup, or checkups. You have full, complete authority in the arrangement, in the contract that he made for you. Our contract with God is called the New Testament. He said, I'm giving you a new agreement. Testament just means agreement. I'm giving you a new contract to love each other as I've loved you. He says, that's what I need you to do. And if you don't do that, I'm not coming in and kicking you out. 
That's why you see so many churches acting a fool, and you don't see God blowing it up and killing it necessarily, especially not immediately. You, you'll, you'll see all kind of crazy about God. Why are you letting this? He said, I gave them the keys. Whether they destroy it or whether they build it, I'm leaving it to them. Just like in the garden, he didn't kick when she was about to grab the fruit, pop her finger. He said, I'm leaving you choice. Either you're going to obey me or not. I'm giving you the, cho- I'm giving you the keys, church. Either you're going to obey me or not. He says, watch this. He says, watch this. I want to show y'all something. I want to show y'all something. Give me my video. I want to show y'all something, a depiction of the kingdom of heaven. Give me, show me real quick. <laughs> Somebody else. They wasn't in the race. They weren't getting no prize. They weren't going to be able to run past and get the TV in the, the. All they had to do was, hey, it's a problem in the body. We got to support. We're going to sacrifice ourselves. And the kingdom was able to continue to roll because its members, its participants, all came into unity. And it looked like it was no different than when the lights was on before because everybody came into unity. And I was looking at that video, I seen that real about a year ago. And I'm like, that is crazy. That is crazy. That's how the body of Christ is supposed to be. When something happens or something goes wrong, we're supposed to come together so succinctly that it, you can't even tell the difference. If they would have had that race and the lights was never on and everybody would have had their flashlights up on there for the beginning, nobody would have been able to tell it was ever a problem. Unless you've seen the beginning of the video and seen that the lights was originally on. That's how it's supposed to be. The body of Christ is supposed to come together so much to where you can't even tell the difference. And I'm not just talking about inside of a church. I'm talking about church to church. God is not a polygamist. His spirit ain't over there and over there and all over the place. And then all of our churches, we don't talk, we don't hang out, we don't do nothing because we're competing for members and we're competing for financial stability. He said, y'all, my spirit is in you. It's one body, one spirit. He said, it's all one body. We are not going to go to heaven. It's going to be the church over there, a church over here, a church over there. And we're going to get to heaven like, hey, y'all, and go over to your church and sit with them. It is the bride of Christ. We all make up a collective body of believers through different visions God has given, different pastors. Go Find a vision and go serve. It's not about that. That's why I tell people that come here, you, people that, believers that come here, you can tell they spend time with God, they feel the Holy Spirit. I say, welcome you home. Hey, bestie. We're going to spend eternity in heaven saying worthy and glory to the Lamb of God, and it won't, none of this stuff and seats and stuff will matter. All that will matter is the fact that we put our belief and faith in Jesus Christ. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to break down this kingdom mindset thing. First, you got to define mindset. What is a mindset? What is a mindset? A fixed, fixed, not moving, not wavered, mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's responses and interpretations of a situation. This is a a mindset. A fixed mental attitude or disposition that predetermines a person's responses, (laughs) predetermines it. That's before it even happens, you have a position you stand on. He says, responses to, a, to and interpretations of a situation. So let's, let's define kingdom. Rule or authority. Kingdom means rule or authority. In reference to God, it's the rule of God in heaven on earth. This includes now and eternity. So when you talk about a kingdom mindset, you're talking about a, a fixed mental predetermined attitude 
based on what God has told you to be, based on the authority God has given you, that predetermines our responses and our interpretations and our attitudes to any situation. We're taking what God and the Word of God is saying, and we're going to apply it in every single area of our lives. We're going to take the word of God. We're going to take his, his, his principles because it, 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 it either it's a direct word in the Bible or it's a principle to follow. Don't give me it ain't in the Bible, so I'm going to just do it. It's a principle in there somewhere for it. He says, take that predetermined fix. That means you, you're fixed. This is what you are. This is what, how you roll. This is what you do. You ain't from all over the place. This is who you are. It, and it, predetermine, it pre, uh, predetermines. So you already have your position. You already have your decision you're going to make based on a situation or an a, a, a issue that route rises, even in your family, even individually, even in relationships, even in church, even in education, even in your money. You look at the word the word of God says, you look at the principles of the scripture, and you apply it and pull it into your life. Watch this. Our predetermined responses, our our predetermined response and interpretation of life situation will be viewed, understood, perceived, and governed by God's rule and authority. That's the kingdom mindset. Our, our viewpoints, understanding, per- perception, policies, actions are controlled by God through the Holy Spirit and his word. We gotta, I want y'all to leave here. I told you it's going to be a teaching series. So I'm going to read a lot more than I'm, I'm trying to not to preach as much and read more. So y'all, we can really grasp this because when we go into our vision and our word for the year, I really want us to understand the foundational thing that's going to make the boat go. Give me my question of the day. Is God first? And I want him to make it really big like that. Because this is a, this is a, this is a life change choice right now. Taking on the kingdom mindset is a life decision. It's not a Sunday I felt good decision. This is a, you leave here and you start, begin to study the word of God so you can see how to live. So you can be a clean vessel. Nobody goes to the kitchen and grabs a cup out the dirty water and just pour some juice in it. You go in the cabinet, and a lot of us, you like me, even when you get the clean ones, you and you look in it. It's a habit. I take it out the cabinet. Okay, it's clean. I'm gonna lend up myself as a clean vessel for heaven to use. Is he first? Because today in my four points, where I want to talk about four things is how do we take the kingdom and put it into our life. See, I had a long, long introduction because I knew I could just go through these points. And if you either you want the kingdom or you don't, either you have gotten to the point where you're tired of yourself and you're going to get, let God have your life or you won't. I can't pressure you into that one. I can't, I can't guilt trip you into that one. Either you're in love with God like that or you, can, or you settle with being just being a believer. It is a difference between Christians and believers. Some people believe that Jesus Christ died and rose on the grave. They believe that with everything in them, yet they live defeated, worthless life. They are useless to the kingdom of God because they will not be sanctified. They drag around in sin, they muzzle around in sin, and then they post six posts about the glory of God and they favor a favorite pastor real, and then they go right back to what they're doing. He says, I need, is he first in every area of your life? He says, a double-bodied man is unstable in all his ways. And this is what happens. We, we, we teeter in the line. We want God, but we want the world too. We want God to accept us, but we want our homies and everybody to accept us too. So we're going through life like this. And some of us get like this because we know God is true, but boy, we deep in the world. But we know he died on the cross for our sins, but we have allowed the enemy to make us useless to the kingdom. So we believe, but are we way down here struggling in just about every sin you can think of? Can't get out of nothing, can't do nothing, been living on earth for 90 years still doing the same thing we were doing when we was 13. Doing the same thing we were doing when we was 20. Living this, making the same silly choice that we did when we were 25. Ain't changed one bit. Going to die with the same, not, not wanting to change, not ever changing, because we don't want to stop doing things and we can't control our flesh. And let me tell I'm, I'm going to go here. Probably going to make half the church mad, but I don't care. One thing I cannot stand, and this is personal, is a weak man. God created the man in the garden. Before it was ever a woman and gave him his word, gave him the orders, gave him his rules, gave him dominion, gave him resources, gave him all he needed and said, have dominion. We have the authority as men 
And, and then he gave him a woman. He said, you have authority and we'll live our entire life defeated. Never really touching the kingdom heavenly perspective. Never really taking dominion over our life. Never really loving our wives. Never really raising our kids. Never really just saying sorry. Never really just going back and loving people and telling our kids, I wasn't there for you. I'm sorry, but I, I'm trying now. Never really trying to get it together. And we live like weak, useless men with muscles, with a six pack. Thinking we strong, but we weaker. And in the image of, in the sight of God, he like, ah, man, what a waste of testosterone that I gave him. All he's going to do is just go to the streets and try to buy a Hellcat wild body charger and, and stuck with his 17 chains on and his, his grill. He's not even going to try to live for me. He's not going to try to be for me, but he's going to be for himself his whole life. Dang, well, kids begging and crying, wishing they could see you. I ain't seen you in weeks, but you could stop by with a Christmas present with some Jordans and thought your job was done. And we have weak manhood out here. And that's why our culture and society is how it is. Because the men will not stand up and say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're going to live clean. We're going to honor him. I'm going to love my wife. And how I love her, you give up yourself. You go down so she can go up. So I don't care about what she did to you. I don't care about how she made you feel. I don't care that she tripping. Okay, and what did you do? I don't care. And what did you do? Like, and how did you respond? Did you respond with love? Did you meet her with I don't care if your kids act crazy. What did you do? That's what we were built for. It. And we allowed the enemy to drag us away into all this other stuff that's, that's popular and good. And one thing I cannot stand sometimes, I see these reels pop up on my timeline, and they'll talk about how he the king. And the, the women got to understand how to, what the king go through. In society and support your king. I'm like, <laughs> you really feel for that? No, king, support your queen. Serve your family. Dot yourself for your family. Why are we programming ourselves to make our family serve us? Why are we programming people to make sure your wife fix your food? When y'all come to me, marriage enrichment, I tell the man, get up and make your wife plates. Because they sit there and like, what you want, give me two ribs? No, get up and you go serve her. Well, I'm trying to reverse this thing that we've done where the man sits there like he King Tut. And the kids serve him. I remember old school, the man sat there first and he got his plate. The kids, nobody ate until he got his. That's ridiculous. He's supposed to be serving the family. He's supposed to be making sure they good. He's supposed to be the last one asleep. Like, how do we mess this up? I get honoring him. I get that. But what we've done is a mindset now, and now the family is weakened because the man won't stand up. Yeah. Right. Let me leave that alone. That's always one know. We are serving when we are loving. We are serving when we, we, when, when we are serving, we are loving. When we are loving, we're operating in the Holy Spirit. When we're serving, we're loving. When, we're op- when, we, when, we, when we love, we're operating the Holy Spirit. When we operate in the Holy Spirit, we're kingdom. How do I get the kingdom, pastor? Start serving. So when you serve, you prove you have love in you because you can go down so somebody can go up. Go up. You, can, you can compassionately, righteously, and selflessly pursue somebody else's well-being. Now you love it. When you're loving, when you're loving, you operate in the Holy Spirit. What's the fruit of the Spirit we said every week? What's the first one? Love. Now I'm operating and producing the Holy Spirit fruit. When I'm producing Holy Spirit fruit, he's living in me and operating through me. Then I'm what? I'm kingdom. You want to a basic, a basic principle of how you get a kingdom or how you take on a kingdom mindset. Start with serving. And then it produce a love in you. That love will produce the Holy Spirit moving in you. And that will produce a kingdom mindset. Very first point. We must understand people without a kingdom mindset if we are to serve them. If we don't ever serve people without a kingdom mindset or understand the sinner, we got to first understand this. We got to first understand them. When we, when we, we must understand people without a kingdom mindset and we are to serve them. Go to Corinthians chapter 2, 1 Corinthians. Ken, get ready for me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Give me 10. Give me, give, give me 10 to 16. Let's go. But it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. Uh-huh. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one... No one, can, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit, mm-hmm. and no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Mm-hmm. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, mm-hmm. so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Mm-hmm. When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. 
Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain <laughs> spiritual truths. But people who aren't spiritual can't receive these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish it to sounds them. It sounds foolish and to they them. can't understand it, for only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. Wait, wait, wait. He says, but people who aren't spiritual can receive these truths from God's Spirit. He says, it sounds like foolishness to them. And they can't understand it. I tried, to, uh, I tried to get on Netflix the other day. And for years, I've never had a Netflix account. For years, I stole my mom Netflix, my mother-in-law. So I got on Netflix. I popped down the couch for my food. <laughs> that mug said, you are not, like, long in. Are you on vacation? <laughs> Miss Cynthia, are you on vacation? I'm like, uh-uh. <laughs> and... I was about to text her, and like, hey, mama, like, <laughs> can you give me double confirmation and give me your password so I get up in here? And then it dawned to me, I'm like, never mind. And I'm like, well, how much is Netflix? I'm like, I ain't paying that. Screw that. I don't need it. And it, something dawned on me. I didn't have connection. I couldn't enjoy all the content, all the communication, all the brand new movies that just come out and all that. I couldn't enjoy it because I didn't have connection. I wasn't willing to pay what it cost to have connection. I didn't have the Holy Spirit connection. And I wasn't willing to serve and love body and give up myself for God to get what it costs to enjoy the things of the kingdom of Netflix. So I said, screw it. Sit on the couch and watch some crappy cable. So I found something stupid because I wasn't willing to give up. And God was showing me when I sat there, this is how we do as Christians. We don't want to give up ourselves. We're not willing to even do what it takes to receive the Holy Spirit so we can understand the things of the Spirit. So we settle for cable. That's free. Everybody got them to six channels or seven channels. Everybody got that frequency. That's a free one. And we, 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 I set up a dumbed-down entertainment. I set up on a dumbed-down connection that everybody got because I couldn't perceive the higher things because I didn't want to pay. It, went even, it didn't even cost that much. My chicken nuggets that I had on my plate cost more than a month's subscription. And I didn't, I didn't find a value in my heart for it. And that sometimes we would sit in church and the word of God would go forth. And we find no value of it. We know, it's, we know it's true. We know it will better our life. We know it's what we need. We know it's what God's been saying to us for 20 years, but we refuse. And we'll settle for basic seven, for channel 41. We'll settle for whatever come on life or whatever that be coming on them crazy little shows because we didn't want to give up what it took. We can't understand the things of the Spirit. Why she go to church every night? That's crazy, girl. But you can go to the bar every night. She had church Tuesday, Monday they had teen, they had the, the young adult Bible study, and Wednesday they had church Bible study, discipleship class, and he had practice on Thursday. Then he got the nerves to want to go clean up on Saturday morning, and then Sunday he's, how do he have time for his own life? See, you, you can't discern the things of the Spirit, boo. See, you don't understand why they would do that every day. You don't understand why they would serve like that. You don't understand why they would love like that. You don't understand why they would do that because you, can't, you don't carry the Spirit. Verse, verse 15 says, those who are spiritual can evaluate all things, but they can, themselves cannot be evaluated by others because they don't understand you, boo. So when all your friends who've been changing up and you didn't clank, clank, locked it up and, they, and, and you didn't did all you can to honor God and they're like, why she thinks she's better than you? See, now she's trying to evaluate you, but she can't. She can't understand you. See, because she doesn't carry the spiritual. She can't understand why her homegirl don't do what she do no more. Why my friend don't do what they, why he don't sit there and get in the rotation with us? Why he don't do what we do no more? They can't understand, so they make up something about you. Because they don't understand the Spirit of God is changing you and redirecting you. He says, he says last verse 16, for who, can know, who can, uh, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to teach him? But, but we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. See, we can understand kingdom in heaven because we've took on his spirit and we've taken on his principles. We've taken on his word. Now we carry his mind. Now we can flow and speak on the, we can prophetically speak on his behalf. Yes, we can do these things because we carry his spirit. Have y'all done talked and spoke to somebody and stuff didn't happen to y'all and y'all like, this, ain't, this is a coincidence. No, you carry the mind of Christ. You operate in Christ. Yeah. So you're always in the right place at the right time. You always saying the right things, and then somebody like, "How did you know that?" I don't know. I'm just got the mind of Christ. I, I, you know, sometimes when stuff come out your mouth from your mind, it happens. Yeah. 
When you carry the mind of Christ and you're speaking in the spirit, and you, you, it just happened. You don't really be thinking about it. Sometimes you're like, I hope I ain't wrong, Lord. I'm just trying to be used by you. And you just flowing what come out of you. And then they end up saying, how did you know? The mind of Christ. His Holy Spirit just told me, I don't know. And you just operating and serving. Watch this, watch this. We got to understand the people who don't carry, carry, carry the mind of Christ. You don't get mad at a blind man. Like, why are you bumping stuff? He can't see. I don't get mad at Karen when I say, bro, go make, man, I want some cereal. Make your own cereal. She's down there mad because she can't reach it. She can't reach it. She a baby. And we're sitting here getting mad at people for not understanding the word of God or not living better or not wanting to come to church with us or our friends that don't get it. They don't carry his spirit. They don't understand what you own. They don't get it. That's why when you post how you post, there'll be people that come like, oh, you, <laughs> I just, that just popped in my head. When you post something about Christ or your commitment to Christ and the world will slap you and slander you for it, like who you think you are? That's why I don't like the church. All I said was how can we give the chiefs more than we give God? I ain't even say nothing. But because they don't carry the spirit or hair, have his mind, there's no conviction in them. The Holy Spirit, don't, so they just like, you just judging us. Well, no, actually, I was just talking about me. <laughs> They don't understand that we have to have a patience and a love and, a, and come down and humble ourselves to understand it. He says in John 3, chapter 3, of John 3, 3, verse 3, he says in the Amplified Version, Jesus answered them, I assure you and I most solemnly say to you, unless a person is born again, reborn above from a spiritual, uh, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, set apart, he cannot ever see and experience the what? Unless you are born again, unless you have given up yourself by the Spirit of God, he is coming to you and living with him, walking with him, you can never understand or see the things of the kingdom. People won't get you. You'll be in your house. You're the only one love God. You're the only one trying to live a certain way. They will never understand you. They will just clown you all the time. They will never be able to see it until they come in and be baptized in the Spirit. In other words, give their life to Christ, becoming sanctified and holy, pursuing his ways. Not perfect. None of us can ever be that. But pursuing his ways. Watch this point two. Kingdom in your talk. Kingdom in your talk. Give me Proverbs chapter 18. Give me TPT. Got TPT? Oh, you do. Watch this. Your words are so powerful that they will kill or give life. I love this version. And a talkative person will reap the consequences. If you want it in the NLT, the tongue can bring death or life. And those who talk will reap the consequences. He says, he says, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. If y'all want the old King James Version. He says, we can spit life. This is kingdom. Mind talk, kingdom talk, kingdom in our talk. Or we can spit death. Whatever you spit, you are wielding. You are wielding heaven through your mouth. You can speak life, or you can speak death. It's in the power of that little thing in your mouth that's stinking the morning. We have the authority of heaven to give to bring forth life or to bring forth death. Watch this. I like the next verse. I want person to hit this, but I got to read it because it's in my face. Verse 22. The man who finds a wife finds a treasure, and he receives favor from the Lord. It's funny because if you want favor, find a wife. I told y'all women are, uh, women, uh, women are unsafe without her husband, and men is incomplete. Because he looked at the man, and what did he say? It ain't good for you to be alone. You ain't complete. Let me find you a... Helper. So he says, a man that finds a wife finds a good thing. He obtains favor from God. Because now you're complete. So now I can bless the whole of you. But I ain't supposed to preach that. That's later in life. Watch this. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 20. I mean, can you, if you just want to bless me again, give me chapter 1, Luke 1, verse 11, and just go. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of an incense altar. He was at the church. He was in the sanctuary at the church. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. Mm -hmm. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. Mm -hmm. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. Mm -hmm. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even mm -hmm. before his birth. Mm -hmm. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. Mm -hmm. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. Mm -hmm. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. Mm -hmm. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children. Mm -hmm. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. 
Watch, watch this before she move on. Watch this. Now, the angel comes to him. What angel was it? The angel of the Lord. So heaven begins to speak in detail. <laughs> this is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to happen. Watch. Now, let's see how Zechariah responds. Go. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Okay, pause. Didn't I just tell you and decree over your life what's to be so? And your only response to me is a lack of faith because you don't believe a word that just came out of my mouth. He says, okay, so since you want to not believe me, go. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very <laughs> presence of God. Pause, pause. <laughs> He said, do you know who you're talking to? Do you know who sent me? I'm Gabriel, the message angel. God sent me to talk to you. I stood before God before I came to you. In other words, he said, I stand in the presence of the Lord. He said, God just sent me to you. Go. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Mm -hmm. But now, since you didn't believe. <laughs> since you I don't said, believe. Uh -oh. See, see. See, see, you got to look at that. He said, since you don't believe. It never said he didn't believe, but he questioned God, and God seen his heart. How can this happen? I'm old. Stuff don't work around this age like it used to. My wife, too, she crumbled up, too. Stuff ain't working. Tell me how this going to work and how this going to happen. He had no belief that the angel that appeared to him was super. He's in the church. That's why you can't miss this. He's in the sanctuary. And let's be honest, a lot of us come in church and we scream and we shout for stuff we really don't even believe if an angel showed up and said it was going to happen. Amen. We wouldn't even stand on it because when the man of God prophesied it and it hit your spirit, like, oh, that's me, we never changed and believed it. We never moved on it at all. So look what happened. He says, go. But now since you didn't believe Since you I don't say, believe. You will be silent and unable to speak until uh, the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled. At the proper time. He said, well, God's declared over you, it's going to happen still, but you won't be able to talk. Shut your mouth until you learn how to have faith. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Shut your mouth, and I, I won't let you speak another word. Since you don't want to believe my word, you will have none. Shut your mouth until you learn faith. The next time Zechariah speaks is because the baby is born, and they over there debate what to name him, and finally he, John! <laughs> John, <laughs> I bet you're screaming what God told you now. I ain't been there to talk for nine months to whatever. Like, I bet you're talking now. We better line up our talk with what heaven is talking. We better line up our words with what that said the Lord. We better get in that Bible and speak what's in the word. See, all he had to do was repeat what the angel said. He, well, instead, he wanted to conflict or go against what he said in disbelief and challenge what the angel said. He said, so since you can't talk, you won't talk. Since you won't have faith, you won't have any at all. Sit your behind there and watch me work. Yeah. Watch me. And, and this is the thing about it. That's grace. Because God could have said, you know what? Let me just go. I'll pick somebody else. See, that's why I sometimes tell you, you can't mess up with God God for your life. It's going to happen one way or another. Oh, I thought I was going to run from it. I was told when I was 13, you're not tall for nothing. And the minute it was prophesied to me in church, I knew exactly what they meant. God didn't make you stick out for no reason. He's going to make you a man that leads his people. He's going to make you a man that leads. And I said, no, you won't. <laughs> Got out of high school, ran to college, ran everywhere. But, 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 but to church. And it's not that I didn't believe Jesus. I would have. You could have put a 12-gun shotgun in my mouth and said, deny him. I said, blow my back out. Blow my brains out. I will never deny the cross of Christ. But I, I, was, I, I settled for bondage because I never wanted to be lead. So I started to be a womanizer. I started chasing the streets and weed and drinking and everything I can possibly do to mask what I knew was supposed to be. I knew it was supposed to be. Went to college, acted a fool because I didn't and, and wanted to never come home. Because I knew when I came home, I had to come right back to words away. Right back to what God had said from the beginning. And I can run all you want. You can buy all the houses and cars and stack all the money that you want. And when you get through, God going to say, you done? Now, are you ready to do what I told you to do? Okay, Lord. Like, whenever you get through what he said and what he said. Now, you can mess up everything on the way and make it harder for you because my behind should have been serving my father back in 2010, back in 2019, and this would have been a lot easier to plant this church. I would have had a nice running organism, but now I just started from scratch in my living room. I made it a whole bunch harder. I had zero members, zero everything. I had to start from nothing. But it would have been a lot easier to take on after God took him home and take over and lead it, but I was too busy running around running. 
I didn't line up my talk with what he'd been told me. I didn't line up my walk with what he'd been declared. And now I had to eat the fruit thereof. All them tears I cried, all that, because you did that. See, sometimes we want God, bless me, pull me out, I'm being obedient. You did that. If you would have lined up when I told you to line up, if you would have got out that bed with that dude when I told you, you wouldn't be pregnant. Now you begging God to help you pay for you a single mom and you weren't ready. I told you what to do to stay out of the situation and you didn't obey. Uh, next point. But point three, kingdom in your needs. Kingdom in your needs. Kingdom in your talk. First, we got to understand people that don't understand kingdom. First, we got to understand people that don't understand kingdom. They don't have the spirit of God. They won't get that. But then we need to insert kingdom into our talk. This is just the top three. We can do this a whole series on just kingdom in. But I just picked the top three. Kingdom in our talk. Next one, kingdom in your needs. Matthew 6, 25. That is why I tell you, do not worry about everyday life. This is red. Jesus is telling you, this is what I'm telling you. Do not worry about everyday life. Whether you have food enough to, uh, uh, whether you have enough food and drink or, or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. He said, let me just give, me a, give you an example. He said, they don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, but your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than the bird? You know, say bird, I just threw that in there. Aren't you more important than the, than the birds and the eagles to God? He says, watch this. He says, can, can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Can your worry ain't help you at all? He says, verse 28, and why worry about clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make clothing. Yes, Solomon, all his glory was never dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that, that are uh, here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? Yeah. He said, why do y'all believe that I'm, y'all don't think I can take care of your needs? Y'all don't believe that I can take care of your needs? Why is y'all faith so small? He says, he says, he says, he says, verse 31, so don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things, watch this, dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. He says people that don't rock with Christ, people who don't believe in him, that dominates their thoughts. That's what they live for. That's what they're loyal to. Not you. He says your heavenly father knows your needs. Oh, I've been walking in this scripture for a while. Because sometimes as a pastor in the church, I hate to worry about money and stuff, but it's actually just a legitimate thing I have to be concerned about, the business of the church. I hate it with a passion. I just wish, like, I never had to worry about money or anything so I can just do the gospel and do what matters. But I have to have the meetings, and I have to figure out what's next. And sometimes I get to worry, like, mm, mm. and I start thinking, like, authority, kingdom, uh-uh, yeah. nah. We set this up for God's kingdom and his glory. I'm not about to worry about that. What we got? Cool. God bless us. Best what we need. We believe you. In the name of Jesus, I'm out of here. He says, don't worry about that stuff. He said, that dominates the people that don't belong to me. That's that's what they do. That ain't what you you do. He says, watch this. Verse 33, seek the kingdom of God. His kingdom talk again. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God above all else. Everything in your life, above that thing you love the most, put the kingdom. Put the work of Christ. <laughs> put what the Holy Spirit produces in you. Put what God wants from you. Put holiness in there. Put serving in there. Put love in there above all else. And what happens when you're able to do that? And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. I love the, the, res- the original verse. says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all those things will be added. He says, when you honor me and you live in the kingdom way, all that other stuff just come with the package. That's in the deal. Because I already knew you, I know you need them. He told the disciples, leave two by two, take nothing. I know what you need. Don't worry. They'll provide on the way. Just go do the work. Go be on kingdom. And the, the, the things you need to come with the package that's in the deal for you. He says, he says, last verse. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's troubles is enough for today. And if any of y'all would testify to that, <laughs> dang. <laughs> Today is enough. There's just enough for today. We close in here. We close in here. Oh, my laptop. Dang, it's over there. <laughs> I was making a joke with the worship team this morning. My laptop over there. Bring it here. Thank you. Point four. 
Kingdom in the church. Kingdom in the church. Thank you. Kingdom in the church. Give me Acts chapter 2. Y'all are goofy. Kingdom in the church. This is the top three, y'all. Kingdom in our walk, in our talk. Kingdom in our needs. We always let our needs drag us down. We went around with these mouths. We, we we're wielding morality in our tongue. We got to understand. And it, listen, watch. Keep your, keep your language above, above ground. And what I mean by that, man, I, I, when we, we do marriage couples, I often, I often tell the couples, when I argue cool, it's going to happen. But keep your daggers above the waist. Because some stuff when you cut, you discard, never leave. You can say all the sorries, and, every, and you told her you ugly, you this, and you was just saying it because you was mad, but every time she looked in the mirror, she was like, man, he don't like this, do he? And you don't know how deep you cut. Can't give me your talk. And then our knees, we always let our knees drain, drown us away from God. Well, I need this, I need this, so we compromise. We miss Bible study because I got to work or I got to do this. And that's just overtime. You didn't have to be there. But we'll compromise for, the, for money because we attach that money and that getting that extra money and that overtime to a need. Kingdom in our knees. Last one, kingdom in the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. Community of believers. I like the TBT version. Every believer was faithful and devoted to the following, to following the teaching. Before we even... Every believer was faithful and devoted to following the teachings of the apostles. So in order for us to have kingdom in the church, first thing we have to do is be a faithful believer devoted to the Bible and the teachings of the church. Devoted to the word of God. This is not an emphasis on me or whoever's preaching that day. It's emphasis on the word of God. They were faithful to the text. They got in it. They, was, they believed it. They got in it. And they faithfully looked at it and lived it. He says, he says, their hearts was mutually linked to one another. Unity, they mutually linked together. They got in the word of God, they was faithfully devoted to it, they followed it, they lived it, and they mutually linked them together in unity. He says, sharing communion, they worshiped, and coming together regularly for prayer. There were some prayers. See, I started to study this before we planted this church. I wanted to see what did the first church be like. Let's just go back to that. Watch what he says. He says, a deep sense of awe swept over everyone, and the apostle performed many miracles, signs, and wonders. All the believers were in the all the believers were in fellowship as one body, and they shared with one another whatever they had. All the believers were in, in fellowship as one body. It was one church back then. I'm not, I'm not advocating that we need to all be one giant church where we fit. That ain't even practical. What I'm saying is we were all, they were all connected in spirit. He said, but back then, this is in the beginning, it was just one. But watch this, I'm going to share something with you in a second. As they shared with one another whatever they had, it was generosity. What's one of our pillars? Generosity. Faith, love, practical Bible teaching, and generosity. You cannot say that you love somebody if you ain't generous. So we give about 30% to sometimes, actually we got up to 56% around one year, and we just gave away. That year we had $110,000 in offerings and tithes. We gave away about over $50,000 something dollars. Like, why? We didn't, we didn't have a building in. We, was, we just gave it away. Why? What are we sitting and stacking it for? Service and let another church get it. Somebody else need a building. We literally had, we we had $4,000 in the bank. And another church down in Florida was trying to get a building. And the, the guy hit me like, man, we just, we sent them $3,000. We sent them 75% of what we had in our savings account. Like, hey, we don't need a building yet, or we ain't got what we need yet. God will bless us when the time come. Right now, let's seed into somebody else. And uh, we had an executive meeting real quick, and it was nothing for them. They're like, let's give more. They start cash happening to the church. Throw an extra hundred on there, pastor. All was first. We got nothing out the deal. It was just we seen a kingdom need some people we ain't never met. And we said, let's, let's, let's support. He says, he says, they was generous and gave people whatever they had. Verse 45, out of generosity... Watch this. They even sold their assets to distribute, to distribute the proceeds to those who were in need among them. All the extra stuff they had, they had three cars, they sold two and gave it to the church so the people who didn't have none could get one. 
This is the level of generosity and service that they acted on. This is the level that they, that they was down for the church and down because being down for the church to them meant being for my brother and sister. Like that, so they did all they could to help their partner out, help their sister out. So all their extra land and extra stuff, they sold it, took the money and threw it before, threw it before the church said, here, help. This is the commitment they have. Daily, verse 46, they met together in the temple courts and in one another's homes to celebrate communion. Now they came together, unity in church, then they did life with each other. They was in each other's house doing the same thing they did together in the temple, praying and communion. Praying for each other, communing with each other, helping each other. This is what they did. This is what the early church, kingdom in the church. They shared meals together with joyful hearts and tender humility. Joy in their house and humility. Last verse of the day. They were continually filled with praises to God. Watch this. Enjoying favor of all the people. They just enjoyed the people of God. Some of us, we've been church hurt to the point that we just go home like, I'm done. Like, I ain't doing another church. I, I really do get it. I ain't gonna lie, I get it. But God is telling us today, if you want to, my kingdom purposes flow through my body, my church, my bride. That's the bride of Christ. I need you connected to the bride. I need you to give that, that, that gift you have and set it before me. I tell people sometimes, first right now, I may not be the church for you. Go somewhere else. And I say that in, in humility because I just, we all going to the same heaven. And then the Holy Spirit something one time convicted me recently. He said, that's not humility. You look, that's cowardice. You know y'all Bible teaching, preaching church. That's great for anybody, old, young, white, black, don't matter. Stop talking about you can speak, speak anywhere. And tell people, come, come, and be a part. I just didn't want to get so hooked up on trying to get more members. That's always the thing, just more people, more people. I am set up with 10 goons, spiritual goons. There we go, that's one. Now remember, it's the Spartans on 300. Spartans, what is your uh, occupation? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Give me 10 dogs that are going to Walmart in the hood with me and speak the gospel. I, I eat. I don't need a thousand. I don't need 500. Give me a handful of dogs. And we're going to put a thousand toes on that wall a year of people that we witnessed to and that didn't know Jesus. A thousand bondage we're going to break off people because we're going to walk around with the authority of heaven and the kingdom authority and just breaking stuff. I don't need a big, I don't need to be famous. I don't need a lot of followers. I get the work done. It's, this community is dying right here. We ain't got, I don't need to be known across the world. I can go right up here and, and the hood is dying right up here in Hickman, right in Ruskin. Give me 10 goons. So I'm not, I, I used to stay away from that guy. I didn't want to look like I'm trying to get members. God said, that's not humility. That's pride. It's okay to tell people to come and be a part because you know this is a good place for them to be. You know, this is a safe place for them to be with good leadership. I, I, I'm, there's no cap uh, to nobody else because I don't know every first lady in the city, but I know that one back there with the kids. I've never seen a woman walk in more, in more grace. She had come home from meetings with y'all, like, what happened? Ain't none of your business what she said. I'm like, I'm the pastor though. I, I need to know how to pray. She don't tell me nothing about y'all. She carries you women. She, she don't even want to lead. She likes to stay away from that because she's like, oh, who am I that God would choose me for anything? Who am I? She's so humble and meek. The meek she's a great woman to serve under and connect to. She's a great woman to tell your business to and let her pray over you. She's the most trustworthy thing I ever met when it comes to a woman of God like that. She's perfect. And one thing I don't know, I ain't perfect, but I ain't going to never give you nothing that ain't out the word of God. I'm not going to ever play around with you like that. I'm going to give you this. And if it ain't in here, I'm going to tell you, I don't know. Let me go find out. I'm going to lead you with integrity. I'm going to lead you. It will never be stuck about me. This church will be about God. It will, the kingdom of God will be had. The Holy Spirit will be welcomed here every week. And I won't impede it or get in his way. Y'all can root me on all you want. Cute. And I love how y'all support y'all pastor. Y'all take care of me. Y'all love me. But we, I will never get in the way of God. I will never walk up on our Facebook. You never will never walk up in this building. You will never walk around and my, I'm plastered everywhere. This is not my house. This is the house of God. And we're going to put Jesus as Lord on every wall. And, and we can't paint. We're about to paint and do some upgrades and some things in here. But you will never see me go around when I'm featured in the church. This is the house of God. And if I die or morally fail, y'all got to keep going. So I got to build this on the Holy Spirit and the Word of God because I'm just a man. I ain't very much either. 
I'm just a man. I need y'all loyal to heaven, not me. I need y'all loyal to the king, not just the pastor, the leader. He says, they shared meals together with joy in their hearts. They continued was filled with praises to God and joined the favor of all the people. Watch this. And the Lord kept adding to their numbers daily those who were coming to life. So you mean to tell me if you're a life-giving church, it'll grow because you're giving life? I used to always like, how can we go to church? How can we go to church? And God starts telling me, just preach my word. Stop trying to turn the tricks and do all this nice media stuff. Just preach my word and, and operate and live for me. I'll grow it. He kept adding people to the church. One time it was 3,000 added. One time 5,000 was added. All because all they did was preach a sound gospel message. And, and, and I'm, I'm talking on this and I'm ending here for a reason. Because we're going to be kingdom in the church. We got to stop picking our churches based on we didn't like it restaurant mentality. Is it a Bible preaching, teaching church? Is it a need there? How do you fit the vision? When you see the vision and you see the church, do you find like, I can serve here? That need to be not what, how can they, what they offer me. Where can I serve? Is it a position here where I can get in here and serve with my talents and gifts? Is the word of God preach? Is the Holy Spirit there? If you can take them off, sit there, that's your home. I, I don't believe, I, I honestly believe, no, I mean, people, I, I, I honestly believe personally that if you sit at the same church for 20, 30, 40 years, this is me, it's a problem. Because sometimes I feel like you'll grow, God will keep moving you, and you'll grow out of certain seasons. So he may have you somewhere for 10, 15 years, and then he may have you somewhere else, and he may say, plant one. I've seen people be at church for 50 years, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a great teaching, there's great leadership. They, but honestly, sometimes I literally believe God will move you. Because I, I believe this, and I told Pastor Anthony this when we planted this ministry. We didn't have no members. And he said, we coming to serve, him and his wife, Essence. I said, okay. And this is, I didn't have no members, nothing. I said, but be ready because you got to leave in some years. I said, come serve and come help. But in a certain amount of years, you need to go plant another one. We need to reproduce. And I wasn't trying to put him out. I just didn't want him to get so comfortable because the whole purpose is that after this, we, it, this is cool and it's running and it's, uh, and it's, and it's, and it's uh, 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 have all his needs met and stable. You need, we, need, we don't need to just get comfortable in here. And, and, and just get watching me. You need to go plant one. You have the gift of leadership too. You and your wife. So suck up, help, learn, and then when it's time to go, we're gonna write a check for you and where you're building that or what you need. Because we can't all just gather up a bunch of in here, 20, 30 men, 50, 60 men, and we. And, and if all of us was really growing like the word of God said we should, we should be running all over each other trying to serve. So somebody need to go make another one. That's the kingdom movement. Sometimes I say we got we've gained this McDonald's mindset in our church. Plant as many as we can, do as many as we can, get as many people with money as we can. I'm like, man, Lord. And the vision he gave me, this is not, I don't care. This is what any God, I don't know the vision. I wasn't in the prayer closet with the other pastors. I can't, I'm not speaking to I'm right or wrong. I'm talking about what God has told me. After it's stable and it's together, go plant another one. Don't worry about people. It may be a church that's only supposed to be 30 people. It's supposed to be them 30 souls that you impact, that them 30 souls impact 30,000 in their lives. Don't worry about that. Just keep producing places for my spirit to be welcome and my word to be taught. We need to be kingdom. We got one more week of this. I don't know if I'm gonna still ask you Sunday. We got one more, we got one more, one more. And this is probably the most important week. Kingdom. We have to take on a heavenly perspective. We have to put on the heavenly glasses and see things from a biblical perspective in every area of our lives. We have to, but we'll live defeated. I got one more question for y'all. Has your entire walk with God been about you? Has all your prayers mostly been to benefit you? Has your entire life of going to church been about you? What you won't or don't want, what you won't or do, wanna do and don't wanna do, when you wanna go or when you don't wanna go, have you lo only loved you? 
because the definition when we serve we're loving so if we haven't served nobody but our own purposes has been about us we only loved us we didn't love anybody else and we haven't loved anybody else we haven't given up ourselves at all for anybody else You got to be more concerned, more concerned, y'all, with kingdom rather than castle. We got to be more looking at what heaven is doing in the city, what heaven is doing in this world, what God is declaring for the church, not our church, not our castle, but the kingdom of God.